One, two, three, four, five. Take a look who's coming down the track. Make way for James, hooray for James. A shiny, shiny paint with a jet black stack. Make way for James, hooray for James. What is the certain end we really should note? It's indisputable. Well, let's take a vote. He's the really splendid engine with a bright red coat. James, the red engine. James is the number five engine on the Northwestern Railway. He is a mixed traffic engine, which means he can handle both goods and passengers with ease. He is an engine that can tackle any job. Although that doesn't necessarily mean he'll always want to. James is cocky, fiery, an attention seeker, and has a very high opinion of himself. He thinks he's all that and a bag of chips. When really, he's actually the smallest of the railway's big engines. You might say James has a little bit of a Napoleon complex. He is painted red, something rather exclusive to him, and he is very proud of this. You'll never meet another engine like him. There is only one James the Red Engine. James is one of the most requested characters I have had for Sodor's Finest, and I think he's appropriate for this one. We already covered 4, 3, 2, and 1. Heh. <laughs> Might as well make Sodor's number 5 the fifth episode. Here is the complete history of James, the most splendid steam engine you will ever meet. As always, we'll start with his origins. Unlike the rest of the main characters, James did not receive a full intro story explaining who he is. James made his first appearance in the series' second book, Thomas the Tank Engine. He was painted black and didn't really look like the James we all know and love at this point. In this story, James's wooden bright blocks failed when a train of rowdy trucks pushed him down the hill on his first day on the railway. Unable to stop himself, James horrifically derailed into a field. He was hardly a character at this point, and was just a prop for the story basically, someone for Thomas to go and rescue. The fact he had a name at all was trivial. Little did Audrey know that this nothing tool of a character would eventually become one of the main faces of the whole franchise. Audrey got the inspiration for this from stories he'd been told by railwaymen at Birmingham about used built engines that were built with wooden brake blocks, which would sometimes catch fire when they applied them going downhill. And thus, James was born. After the colossal success of the first two books, Wilbert Audrey was approached by Edmund Ward to write a third one. Audrey thought, well, who do I focus on this time? I introduced some nothing character called James in the previous book. I guess I'll do something with him. But before James could become an actual character, he needed a backstory. Reginald Payne illustrated James as an inside cylinder mogul, aka an engine with six main drive wheels with inside motion, and a single set of pilot wheels at the front, which was a very rare and unusual wheel configuration not very common in the UK. But that's how he was drawn, and it's what Audrey had stuck with. Sticking to his initial inspiration, he decided James would stay of George Hughes' origins, and concluded he must be something from the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway, of which Hughes was the chief mechanical engineer of. He was officially labeled a Class 28 060 steam engine, however was an experimental one, with larger drive wheels, an extended footplate, and a front pony truck added in an attempt to fix the 28's front heavy issues when traveling at high speeds. The experiment did not produce the results as desired, and James was eventually sold off to the Northwestern Railway after grouping. He arrived on Sodor in 1925, still in his black livery, and crashed on his very first day. Yikes. After his crash, James was repaired and fitted with actual brakes, and in one of Audrey's most genius moves ever, he decided to make him red to stand out among all the others, who were all still blue at this time. In canon, the reason he's red was because the fat director had him painted in a bright new color to make him feel better after his accident. He returned to work in red later that year, and has consistently stayed that way ever since. James, in the guise that we know him, made his debut in the series' third installment, James the Red Engine, his spotlight book. 
It should be noted that this is Audrey's least favorite book of the series, as he said he was rushed to finish it to meet a deadline, and wasn't particularly inspired by anything. And well, it kinda shows. In this book, James arrives back from the works with his brand new paint job, very cocky and sure of himself, which causes a series of incidents. He soils Sir Topham's top hat, creates a leak in a coach's brake pipe, and loses his trucks on the hill. But he makes up for it in the end when he tackles said trucks, and later successfully pulls the express after Gordon fails. And well, I hate to say it, but that's kind of where James's arc ends, in Wilbert's books anyway. For the rest of the series, James stays relatively stagnant. When he is in the spotlight, he's always given the same kinds of stories. James is boastful and rude to X character, embarrasses himself, and then X character saves the day. I'm gonna make a pretty bold claim here that I think a lot of people are probably gonna disagree with, but here goes. I think James is the weakest of the famous eight engines in the books. He's a fun character, of course, and I love him. But in terms of backstory and character journey, I feel like James hardly goes anywhere and has little impact on the overall plot of the Railway series. Let's compare James's arc to the rest of the characters. Edward, one of the first engines on the railway, gets replaced by newer engines and is eventually forgotten about. He frequently has to prove himself to the others that he's still capable and eventually makes a grand exploit that proves he is indispensable once and for all. And the engines all forever respect him after that. Henry, was dealt a bad hand from the very start and was always on the cusp of being sent away. The weakest and most pathetic of all the engines at the beginning, and over the course of the series becomes the fleet's biggest chad. Gordon arrived a hot shot and was the newest thing in steam traction at the time. Grows old as the series goes on and becomes humbled by life events. Ends his arc by humbling accepting his fate and giving his job to the next newest engine waiting in line. Thomas, a cocky shithead that is very full of himself. He longs to pull trains and has several obstacles to conquer before he can do so. He works hard for several months and finally proves just how mature he's become when he rescues a fellow engine. He gets promoted from station pilot to running his own branch line. James, a cocky shithead that is very full of himself. He longs to pull trains and has several obstacles to conquer before he can do so. He works hard for several months and finally proves his... Oh, James's arc was basically just Thomas's again. Like it's the same idea underdog that is overly confident and only humbled after a series of incidents, and then proves himself when another engine fails and he comes to the rescue. Not exactly the most inspired, and I attribute that to Audrey being rushed when he wrote the third book. It's pretty obvious to me why this is his least favorite of the series. So does James having a pretty nothing arc make him a bad character? Absolutely not. Not every character needs to be fully fleshed out and have depth, but I think it's at least worth addressing that James is lacking compared to the others. However, I would not say James isn't important. He does contribute significantly to the journeys of each of the characters I just went over. He's a constant figure in all of them. He's the engine that Edward rescues in Old Iron. He's the one that vocalizes to the audience Henry's disposition in Cole. He's the one that Gordon consistently belittles toward the beginning and then later helps out starting the beginning of his character shift. And he's the one that Thomas rescued, which led to him getting his branch line. While James may not have a strong arc himself, he is a significant figure in everyone else's. Something else I love that Audrey played with was James's dynamic with Toby, which only appears a couple times and is only in Wilbert's books, but I love it. James is a very cocky character, very overconfident, and will always go over the top unless someone stops him. Toby's character is a perfect contrast to that. Toby is a wise old grandpa that doesn't give a shit. Whereas someone like Edward would probably try to talk sense into James, Toby is the type to just smirk and nod and let the idiot make a fool of himself because he just doesn't care. You know, little Toby, I'm an important engine now. Everybody knows it. They come in crowds to see me flash by. Says you. A perfect character combo and one I wish the books had played with more. Toby is such a mood in the books, I really look forward to doing a video on him. I mentioned this in the Henry video before, but something Chris liked to play with in his books was Henry and James's rivalry. They're treated both as second best to Gordon, and often argue and end up trampling over each other. This dynamic shows up a number of times, and are some of Chris's best stories in my opinion. 
It's overall handled pretty half-baked, but something Chris also attempted to tackle was James' prejudice against Diesel's. Which, funnily enough, was sort of set up by Wilbert in his books. After Diesel gets sent away, James brags to Duncan that he was the one that got him sent packing. When Boko arrives, James is the one that snuffs him right away. This prejudice isn't really touched on again until Chris took over. Chris's second book, James and the Diesel Engines, attempted to continue this story arc. Did it actually do it well? Eh, not really. In this book, there is a story about a snooty diesel that visits the railway and has no connection to James. James says diesels are weird in the second story and then crashes into a signal. The third story is a James and Henry story that has nothing to do with diesels. Okay, why is this here? And the last story is James breaking down and a diesel rescues him. And only after talking to the diesel on the way to the works does James decide that they're actually alright. This story, called Deep Freeze, is so half-baked, I'm sorry. This diesel isn't even one the audience knows. It's not Boko or Bear. No, it's just some rando with no name. And we don't even see its face. Why wasn't this bear is my question. Would have been an excellent opportunity to build his character a bit more. This is probably Chris's weakest book in terms of structure, in my opinion. I really like the idea of a book dedicated to James's Diesel prejudice and then winning him over, especially in the time period when the book took place, when diesels were the dominant form of rail transportation in the UK. But the book does not really deliver that in a satisfying, conclusive way. I appreciate the attempt to do something new with the character, though. After this, James is not really relevant in the series again. He shows up from time to time, but he basically becomes the NPC in this universe. He does have a couple stories with Henry which are fun, one of which he pulls the Flying Kipper, and another where they doublehead the Express. But beyond that, James doesn't contribute a whole lot to the series at all. I think I've talked enough about James in the books. Let's now take a look at how the TV show handled him. James's debut in the TV series is a little bit different from the books. While in the books, James was a new engine when he had his famous crash, in the TV show it sort of implied James was already on the railway for some time. He appears frequently in the background of the first few episodes, always in the sheds, at the big station, teasing Thomas, or just passing by with trains. He was also always red in the show, and always the number five. It is mentioned that he had his accident on his first day. He could well remember that dreadful accident on his first day. But the rest of the episodes contradict this, so I'm just going to ignore that. In the episode, Thomas and the Breakdown Train, we learn James's name and he has his famous crash. Thomas rescues him, and after a time at the works, James returns ready to prove himself again. The first two seasons play out exactly like the books. James's episodes are pulled straight from the pages. He loses his trucks on the hill, he pulls the express when Gordon fails, he goes on strike with the big engines, he crashes into tar tankers, he runs away without his driver, his goods train gets demolished by Douglas. While James started to fade away in the books around this point, he was prominently pushed into the foreground as the show continued, and they started writing more original stories for him, pairing him more often with characters that he didn't really associate that much in the books with, like Percy and Thomas. From season 3 onwards, a very minor change occurred, and it's something that ultimately changed how James is defined as a character for the rest of the entire series. James becomes very proud of his red paint. He's proud of his smart red paint, and so is his driver. You look as bright and cheerful as my red paint. He liked to show off his smart red paint and was determined to be as fast as Gordon. And this becomes an absolute staple of his character for the rest of the entire show. It's something so integral to his character that I bet a lot of you watching didn't even realize this was a season 3 thing, huh? James was never outwardly proud of his red paint in the books. He talked kind of highly about it when Toby asked him about it once. And he was worried he might get painted blue like everyone else if he acted up at one point. But that's about it, really. In the show from season 3 onwards, James is very proud to be red and makes sure everyone knows it. Look at me! I mentioned in the intro that James can be described as having a bit of a Napoleon complex, which I think is something more exclusive to the model series than anything. And it is ever so prevalent when James and Gordon are paired up. Gordon is basically the king of the railway, the express engine, the highest prestige engine there is. 
James has a huge ego and an incredibly high opinion of himself, so he sees himself as also an important express engine. Right up there with Gordon, his equal in his eyes. Only for Gordon to stomp on him and push him back down to reality. Gordon very clearly just tolerates James. <laughs> he doesn't see him as an equal, and only really treats him as such when he needs him to stand with him on something. I really enjoy this dynamic, it's very comedic. In Season 3, James blatantly lies and willingly puts himself into a pickle just to seem impressive to Gordon. But Sir Topham Hatt has plans for me. What plans? Uh, wait and see. Oh dear, he thought. Now what'll I do? Everyone says No Joke for James is a boring episode, but I disagree wholeheartedly. It's a very strong character episode in my opinion. Later on in the same season, Gordon pities James and gives him horrible advice that just lands James in more trouble at the end of the episode. In Season 7, Gordon decides to knock James down a peg when James gets a spotlight job and won't shut up about it. The Gordon and James episodes are so fun because in all of them, James never wins and Gordon always comes out on top. No matter how hard James tries, he'll just never be on Gordon's level. So why does James continue to act this way, despite never winning? My take on it is that he's simply in denial of who he is. He's a medium-sized mixed traffic engine, but wants the prestige of being a big celebrity express engine like Gordon. I should love to pull the express and go flying along the line. So he subconsciously idolizes the guy, although he'd never admit it. And I think that leads to a much bigger observation of who James is. James has a big ego, thinks the world of himself, and prides himself on being such a splendid engine that deserves better. But he's just some mogul. A medium-sized general-purpose engine built for mixed traffic work. A common workhorse. He's nothing special. You're only a goods engine. I pull coaches, too. He so hard wants to believe that he's some flashy Porsche. But in reality, he's just a Honda Civic with a nice paint job slapped on it. Not a bad car by any means, but certainly nothing to brag to your friends about. It's obvious to everyone else who James is, except himself. Something very exclusive to the TV series is Thomas and James's dynamic. I mean, think about it. Thomas and James barely interact in the books. Thomas left for his branch line because he rescued James. So by the time James was an established character, Thomas had already left the yard. In the TV series, James and Thomas pair up very well, and it's because they are so similar. When Thomas actually is in character, he's also a hothead, impatient, and not very bright. I find episodes like The Trouble with Trees, and even later ones like Follow That Flower or Thomas' New Trucks, actually quite enjoyable because you're basically just watching two hot-headed jackasses try to one-up each other. They're funny. I'm the one who needs a new coat. Look at me. I'd rather not. James and the Red Balloon is a pretty funny episode too, because these two idiots actually somehow convince each other a hot air balloon of all things could actually replace them. It's a story that could only work with them. Thomas and James bring out the worst in each other when they're paired up. It's always a guaranteed fun time. The later model seasons loved playing with Thomas and James together. They also really loved the Edward and James dynamic, and oh man, so do I. I think the idea was that they were both medium-sized engines, so they'd often pair them. Similar to how Henry and Gordon would usually pair, because they're the two big ones. Most of these types of episodes follow a similar structure to Old Iron. James thinks he's better than Edward and heeds his advice, only to make a fool of himself. Season 10 turned this dynamic on its head in the episode James the Second Best, where everyone pretty unanimously agreed that Edward was better, and deserved to be on a poster for the railway. So throughout this episode, James strives to prove that he is better than Edward. Not because he thinks Edward is useless, as per usual, but because he feels emasculated by him. And the results are hilarious. A surprisingly strong and pretty unique episode for this era. I like this one a lot. And after the events of this one, James is never rude to Edward again. And they seem to work together as equal partners. I really love that. I can't think of a single model series episode where James is really ever out of character. Like the only one that comes to mind is that incredibly boring circus train one from season 8 where he's weirdly helpful and kind. But like, that episode is so nothing anyway that it doesn't really offend. Random side note, I rewatched this one recently and what the hell, why is Toad the brake van of the circus train? That's just weird, why'd they do that? 
The word I would use to describe James in the model series is consistent. James is consistent. And I think that's why he is so many people's favorite character. There is never any doubt of who James is. Not like Edward, where he switches between a respectable old man with experience and a pathetic virgin. Or Percy, who just got dumber and dumber over time. The railway inspector arrives today, Sir Topham Hatt said. What's a railway testicles? Percy asked. James is, and always has been, the lovable jackass of the group. An overconfident, rash, easily offended, easily swayed, impatient, extroverted, lovable, wannabe star. And when we're talking the later model seasons that got so much wrong, this is really high praise. James is one of the best parts of this era of the show. He's consistently always a strong character, and his episodes were usually the standout ones. He was consistently good until the end. The model series handled James extraordinarily well. Now, how does CGI hold up? Explaining how James was handled in the CGI series is going to be a bit of a challenge, because he's handled differently depending on the head writer of the era. Let's dive in. So James's backstory is, once again, a little different in the CGI series. As depicted in The Adventure Begins, he arrived well before Thomas did. Until Thomas came along, he was the newest engine and was pretty eager to prove himself convinced the Fat Controller would be giving him a branch line of his own next. But you just wait and see if Sir Topham Hatt doesn't give me my own branch line soon. He did a lot of shadowing Gordon around, agreeing with him on pretty much everything and impersonating him to seem more important. He's like Gordon's posse. I really like that. Shows how much of a poser he was at this point in time. He was actually painted black until his crash in this timeline too. After the trucks pushed James off the rails, Thomas rescued him, and the rest is history. During the first four CGI seasons, when Sharon Miller was head writer, I feel like James was handled as a bit of an afterthought. He had his mandatory spotlight episode once a season, but beyond that, most of his appearances were mundane, any character could take the role sort of appearances. Like, I can't really place something significant James did in any of these episodes, besides being involved in one of the dumbest crashes of the entire show. There was a rather novel episode where he had to leave the works while still in a pink undercoat. That was a neat idea. It's a very boring episode, but it was kind of fun seeing James in a position of total insecurity. That was new for him. When Andrew Brenner stepped in and the show entered its renaissance phase, James really became a main character again. Brenner has gone on record of saying that James is one of his favorite characters, so I guess that's why. He was really pushed as the series' third main having big roles in most of the movies, and multiple spotlight episodes every season. Like most of the main characters during this time though, James suffered quite a bit from flanderization. As in, he was still in character, he was always consistently his jerky cocky self, but it was like always dialed up to 100, and sometimes it got to a point where he'd become a bit insufferable. Here's James! I think season 18 was probably the worst of this. In this season, there are three James-centric episodes in a row, where he's an unlikable jerk, learns from his mistake, and then it just resets to him being full 100 jerk again in the next story. The movie Tale of the Brave dialed James's jerkiness to a major 110, where he's probably the most unlikable he's ever been in the series' history. However, this was intentional, as he is the antagonist of this story, and he gets his just dues at the end. His arc in this movie is actually really wonderful. He is so apologetic at the end of it, and it really feels like he went through a major change. I genuinely love Tale of the Brave, and I love this arc, and I would love this even more if they stuck to this character change in the seasons following. Season 20 is the best CGI season, for a multitude of reasons, and it treated James very well, I think. James has two spotlight episodes this year. The first one, which is called Pouty James, is about James being a selfish jerk as usual. His attitude has changed when the others convince him to start looking at the bright side of life and act a little silly sometimes. Come on, James! Put a smile on that face! By the end of the episode, James seems to have taken on a new lease on life, and it ends on a pretty hopeful note. The next James episode, called All in Vain, 
surprisingly seems to continue this character shift. Which is actually kind of insane in retrospect. Like, holy shit, you mean to tell me James didn't completely reset this time? Oh my god, wow. In this episode, James tries to keep a smile on his face despite multiple incidents messing his paintwork up. He's really trying, and you can tell it's hard for him. He's still the same old James, though, and he stresses so much over an imperfection on his paintwork that it becomes his ultimate undoing. I really like this episode. James is likable and very sympathetic here. The first time in God knows how long. This little arc James had this season, while seemingly kind of mundane, was actually quite nice. It's just a pity it totally reset when the next season started. It's times like this where I get frustrated at this era of Thomas for being a status quo show. Like yeah, I know it's a kid's show, and I'm not expecting gravity-defying art house character arcs or anything. But for this era of the show where continuity was such a priority, where they loved to world build and continue to expand the railway and create these new locations and histories, the characters frustratingly stay static. They learn lessons and show signs of changing, only to reset when the next season starts. Hell, in some cases, they reset when the very next episode starts. If you're going to attempt a story arc where a character changes drastically, could you maybe stick to it? It is absolutely my biggest gripe with the Brenner seasons. In season 21, James crashed into Tidmouth's sheds, which kickstarted a story arc that wrote Edward off the show and led into the Big World Big Adventures reboot. Thanks for that, James. The Boba seasons just kind of forgot James existed. He appears throughout them, but he didn't really have any spotlight roles. There was one episode that continued the Shed Crash story arc from the previous season. That was kind of neat. I liked that one. But other than that, James doesn't really do anything. He imagined being a superhero once. Never fear! Rail Rocket is here! And then the show ended. James in CGI definitely had its moments. They did some things with him that I absolutely love. I love what they do with him in The Adventure Begins. I love his arc in Tale of the Brave. I love how much of a total straight man character he is in Journey Beyond Sodor. And I loved his little arc in Season 20. Besides that though, I think the rest of James' appearances in CGI suffer greatly from character flanderization and the show's frustrating insistence on keeping a status quo. He wasn't totally slaughtered beyond belief like Henry was. Like he still felt like James most of the time. Just James dialed up to 100. It's weird for me to say that James, one of the main faces of the Thomas franchise, didn't have really that crazy of a journey over the course of the series. He was very much the same pretty much throughout the whole run, but he was a consistent character. And that's high praise for most of the characters on this show, who for the most part vary greatly depending on the era. The Railway series, the Model series, and the CGI series are all very different. But they do have one thing in common, and that's how consistently James was written in all of them. If I had to choose one though, it'd have to be... Model Series. The number of character dynamics and unique stories the Model Series played with James is really unmatched. A mere reflection with Thomas, an unwitting peer and eventual partner with Edward, second best to Gordon, a victim to Toby's enabling, and silly hijinks with Percy, James has some of the most fun character pairings in the whole show. James is always at his best when he has someone to bounce off of. It doesn't matter who it is, he's fun with everyone. And I think that, alongside his very consistent personality, is what makes him such a standout character in the show. He's just fun. James is just a fun character. One the show simply could not be without. Thomas and Friends just wouldn't be whole without our one and only James. The shine, the shine, the pink, with the